for the session tomorrow on the board. So, you know, if you want to present your open problem, add your name. All right, so for the last uh, session of the morning, we're really happy to have uh, Sham Kakade here, and he's going to be telling us about, you know, the statistical complexity of reinforcement learning, right? So, you know, if we want to understand sample complexity in multi-agent RL, where, where do we have to start? Single-agent RL. So do you want to go ahead and take it away, Sham? Okay, great. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, for joining, and thanks to Simon's uh, and the organizers for uh, putting together this uh, forward-looking workshop. Uh, and as Dylan pointed out, this talk can be viewed as a precursor to uh, the multi-agent problem uh, because uh, it's a precursor because uh, as we start moving to challenging problems uh, in AI. Uh, RL is becoming one of the, the dominant paradigms for, uh, for interactive learning. And uh, there's a sense in which the only setting that's more general than uh, the RL problem is throwing strategic agents into the mix. Uh, so the focus of this talk is really going to be going through understanding this precursor problem of how we deal with um, large, high-dimensional interactive decision-making problems. Uh, problems and trying to get at the uh, the statistical complexity of, of these problems. So uh, let's quickly remember our challenges in reinforcement learning. We've got exploration, the environment may not be known. We've got this credit assignment problem in that we have to take a sequence of decisions uh, to obtain some uh, rewards. And on top of all of that, in challenging problems, we've got uh, high dimensional state and action spaces. Okay, so before I go through the layout of the talk, let's just refresh our memory uh, for how we think about generalization and quickly go through some uh, basic results in supervised learning and uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, so starting with supervised learning, um, the bottom line in supervised learning is we have a pretty good idea of how and why we can generalize in supervised learning. And by that, I mean, uh, we can get reasonable uh, image recognition systems without seeing every possible image in the world. Okay, so in particular, uh, we can do well in this agnostic learning setting, meaning that if we want to find the best classifier in some hypothesis class F or best regressor, uh, and, you know, to some epsilon app uh, additive approximation, the number of samples we need scales only logarithmically with the size of this class. You know, there are many generalizations of this to uh, finite dimensions, uh, margin-based results, uh, neural networks uh, with bounded VC dimension, and so on. But we have a number of complexity measures that in various settings uh, are oftentimes even if and only if statements for when we can uh, generalize. The key point in supervised learning is we can reuse data. Uh, so with a training set, we can try out every classifier uh, on our training set to see how well it does. Let's look at RL. Uh, I'm gonna use the standard notation for reinforcement learning. So states or actions uh, are as rewards. We have an underlying process, a markup process where the agent takes an action, observes the state, obtains the reward uh, and uh, transitions to the next state. So uh, our policy pi is a mapping from states to actions. Uh, we are gonna observe a trajectory uh, once we execute our policy, so think of a trajectory as a sequence of state action reward uh, pairs over eight steps. So we uh, will execute a trajectory and we'll, so we'll execute a policy and we'll observe a trajectory. And our notation is gonna be the standard one where we have a value function of the policy at state S. So this is the future uh, expected value over eight steps of starting at state S and taking policy pi. And we have this an analogous sort of Q function, this one step look ahead function, which is we start in S, take A, uh, execute it for H steps. Uh, this will be our execute the policy pi for H steps. This will be our expected reward. Okay, and our goal is to maximize a policy from some say fixed starting state or distribution over start states. And the key in the setting 
is uh, just like supervised learning, we're going to assume we don't know the world. Uh, so we have an unknown Markov decision process. We're going to act for eight steps, and then we'll repeat. So we've got this episodic setting. Okay, and what we'd like to do is min mi um, you know, minimize some notion of regret or right, obtain good performance. Okay, so uh, let's cover some uh, basic results here before we bump up a level and ask, ask our question. So uh, the most basic uh, setting here is let's just assume uh, the, the problem is small, like this grid world kind of example, and maybe there's uh, stochastic dynamics here. Okay, and you know, we've got this beautiful result uh, going back to Kearns and Sig, uh, showing that there is an algorithm with, with a polynomial number of samples uh, in the number of states, actions, and horizon uh, that can actually find a near optimal policy, and it can get low regret. Okay, and this is non-trivial because to do this, you actually have to balance exploration and exploitation. And they had this clever method of kind of propagating uncertainty bonuses through a dynamic program. Okay, and, and even this is uh, non-trivial unlike the supervised learning setting. Okay, so let's uh, look at the other extreme because the types of problems we're interested uh, in are all these big problems. So we can ask uh, this question of what about uh, finding uh, say some policy or value function uh, that's best in class, like the analog of this agnostic supervised learning problem. So in particular, we can ask this question of, can we find uh, say the ep epsilon best policy, again, with no dependence on the number of states, uh, just like an image recognition, we want no dependence on the number of images in the world. Uh, so we'd like to have no S dependence, say polynomial horizon dependence, and maybe logarithmic dependence on uh, the, the number of policies in the, say, finite policy class. So this is like the most uh, basic agnostic uh, reinforcement learning question. Okay, and it's not too difficult to convince yourself that in fact, this is not possible. Uh, that, you know, just uh, consider a binary tree uh, where, you know, you can move between nodes. There's one unknown rewarding leaf node. Okay, there are two to the eighth possible policies and it's pretty clear you're gonna have to try uh, essentially all of them to find this rewarding leaf node. So you can't really get below uh, either two to the H or log number of policies. Okay, so this rules out this- uh, Sean, uh, sorry, is that supposed to just be number of policies rather than log number of policies? Ah, uh, yes, that's a bug, sorry. Yes, thanks, Dylan. Um, yes, let me fix that. Yes, that should be a number of policies. So you, you can't get, uh, you can't really get um, uh, log dependence. Uh, sorry, no, no, no. Uh, that is, uh, uh, sorry, it's the max of those two. Sorry, that, that's what I meant. Uh, so, uh, the, but, but the basic point is that, uh, sorry, no, no, it's, it's me. The, the basic point is you cannot get a logarithmic dependence until you have A to the H samples. Okay, and the converse of that is once you have uh, exponential and H samples, you can actually get logarithmic dependencies. Okay, and the basic point here is unlike supervised learning, uh, we can't reutilize the data very easily because, because of the interactive nature of this pro problem, uh, we have to try a policy to obtain data. And it's not obvious that this is gonna be informative of the performance of other policies. Okay, so what I've tried to set up now is two extremes. Okay, so we've got this one case when we, where we have a tabular MDP. Think of a tabular MDP as, um, you know, I call it tabular because just the number of states and actions are small. So when we try solving this problem, we can kind of enumerate over the states we're visiting. So that one we can solve efficiently in terms of, a, in a statistical sense. And we've got this other extreme that if we just have some parametric policy class and we'd like to find the best, say, policy in that class or the, the optimal value function in that class, uh, that is not possible without having an exponential dependence on the horizon. Again, what this talk is about is really trying to understand uh, what lives in this region of where RL is possible uh, in some statistical sense, meaning uh, mild dependencies on uh, problem parameters of interest, and, and what separates this region from what is not possible. Okay, and we're really going to try to get some intuition uh, about what's going on here, both in terms of necessary and uh, sufficient conditions. Okay, so that's gonna be the, uh, 
what this talk is about. And, and there's a sense in which uh, this talk is really going to be surveying uh, just tremendous progress um, from the community on, on these questions. And I'll be going through uh, how the community has uh, tried to address these problems, uh, some of really the some of the breakthroughs we've had uh, in trying to understand this, uh, and um, there's a sense in which we've made a fair bit of recent progress on this as well. Okay, so we're going to start with one of the most basic questions, which is, uh, can you do RL uh, with linearly realizable value functions? In a sense, this question is trying to uh, give us a little understanding why RL is, is pretty subtle. Okay, then we'll jump into looking at sufficient conditions and what's known in the literature. In a sense, this part is really going to be a little intuition why it's complicated. And, and finally, we'll um, uh, look at some uh, recent work on this new idea of the decision, decision estimation coefficient. And there's, um, you know, I argue there's a real sense in which this is the answer for a very general complexity measure, which governs the learnability of uh, both RL and interactive decision learning problems. Okay, so I'm going to jump in. Uh, definitely feel free to uh, ask a couple of uh, clarifying questions along the way. So again, we're going to um, keep this running picture as, as an example, and we're trying to understand um, where things are statistically doable. Um, we'll kind of get a sense of what I mean by that, and, and where, in a sense, uh, you can't do things um, easily statistically. Okay, and the most basic uh, question to start with is that of assuming we can approximate the optimal value function with some linear features, right? This is really just the analog of questions about linear regression and uh, linear-based classification methods. Okay, and uh, when you think about, you know, in a sense, the simplest approaches we, te we, tend, to, um, we, we tend to utilize in machine learning and statistics are, are linear ones. So here we could think about approximating our state action value uh, with, uh, with a function that is linear in some known features. And, and the idea here is we want the dimensionality of this function to be much, much smaller than the number of states and actions, because uh, that, that is what allows us to uh, avoid this curse of dimensionality. And not surprisingly, this, uh, this idea is very, very old. It's, it's kind of implicit even in some of Shannon's work. It's probably older than that, where even he was kind of discussing uh, an idea of uh, kind of uh, associate, uh, associative relations uh, with the reasonable features. Okay, and uh, there was this kind of precise line of questions about trying to understand what properties do our features need to satisfy uh, in order for these linear methods to, uh, to work in reinforcement learning. Okay, and you know, these questions are really analogous to uh, what we do in, say, supervised problems or, say, bandit problems when the horizon is one, like uh, a linear bandit problem. Okay, so precisely, uh, so, so here's um, one precise uh, result, which is um, uh, a bit surprising. Uh, and, and I think this really has a lot of deep implications for, uh, for how we think about RL and you know, to the extent that RL is relevant for agents, this has um, uh, deep implications for the multi-agent setting as well. Okay, so the simplest assumption you can possibly think of uh, with regards to linear maps is let's just suppose Q star lives in the span of these features. So for every state action pair, there exists some weights such that this optimal uh, value function lives in the span of these features. Okay, and uh, we can also make the problem easier by making an assumption that the best action has value that's you know, non-trivially better than the second best action. Right? So in, like the, in, in a multi bandit problem, this is known as a large gap assumption. Uh, and it basically says it's very easy to identify the best action. Okay, so these are two assumptions where we might hope uh, to make that, that will make the problem easier to, to, to solve. Okay, and uh, basically there's a series of results uh, uh, addressing this problem. Okay, and uh, in one of the stronger versions of it, it's this uh, theorem here, which says, assume we have an MDP, which has this linearly realizable value function, and you have a suboptimal suboptimality gap. Okay, and you're in this episodic setting where you don't know the MDP, you just start, run for eight steps and repeat. Okay, and 
the point here is that you need a number of samples that's exponential either in the dimension or the horizon to find some policy that is uh, additively close to optimal. Okay, and this is like a slightly stronger version of this result by Weiss et al. And uh, you know, I, I would say technically this result by Weiss, this is really a breakthrough result. I mean, many people have been thinking about it and this really has uh, deep implications because there's a real sense in which the baby case in RL, which is linearly realizable value functions, we cannot solve this statistically. Okay. And this result holds, uh, say, without a gap, even in a gen with a generative model, for those of you familiar with that. And, and these are pretty subtle uh, proofs. So, so the proof here is actually relatively concise, but it is, um, you know, it, it takes a while to understand what's going on here because there's a lot of subtleties here. Okay. Uh, and it turns out that the analogous result for uh, linear realizable policies is also not sufficient for sample efficient RL, meaning that if the policy uh, can be realized with a linear classifier with a large margin, uh, then you also can't do uh, RL uh, sample efficiently where you'll need either exponential or the, the dimension or horizon samples. Okay, and in a nutshell, uh, we're seeing a separation now between the horizon one problem and the horizon greater than one problem, because the horizon one problem, the analogous problems are, you know, bandit classification or regression, which we know we can do with a polynomial number of samples. Okay, but once the horizon becomes larger than one, uh, we start degrading exponentially. Okay, so uh, this is in, in some ways um, a bit disappointing because it really is suggesting we're going to need more complicated uh, assumptions to get things to work. Okay, and, and it is, you know, it's the, the most obvious thing we would try. Okay, so let's go back to our, uh, our picture here. Uh, so we've got these tabular MDPs, which we could do. And disappointingly, uh, you know, what's our game here? We, we clearly can't do things agnostically, so we make stronger assumptions. But the most natural, stronger assumptions we make, we still can't do it. Okay, uh, so now we might start asking what are uh, sufficient conditions uh, for RL? Meaning, can we get a sense of what lives inside here? And note that this is a bit of uh, a subjective um, uh, um, line in that I'm, I'm calling like exponential quantities in the um, exponential problem dependent quantities, uh, having those dependencies as being RL not being possible. Okay, so, uh, so if we have an exponential in D quantity, uh, I'm going to place those types of problems outside of this uh, this red boundary. Okay, so so let's try to get a sense as to what are sufficient conditions. Okay, and I'm just going to summarize uh, some of the ways we've uh, uh, the community has attacked this problem and some of the progress that has been made. The questions up to here. Okay, so uh, on to sufficiency. Okay, so. Uh, we know we can't do best in class. Uh, we know we can't do linear realizable Q star. But not surprisingly, if we start making stronger and stronger assumptions, there's lots of things we can do. So there's a whole, uh, there's a whole list of uh, various assumptions where uh, we can do things well. And we might be asking, you know, what's the relationship between these various uh, model classes and what permits sample efficient learning? So, so let's just uh, try to get a sense of uh, these various different models uh, and uh, generalizations and structural characterizations of when things are possible. This is a picture. It turns out, well, we know linear uh, LQRs, you can uh, do sample efficient RL. Uh, in a sense, they're even simpler than uh, MDPs because you don't really need to explore. Uh, there's a very influential model by uh, some of the participants in this uh, in this workshop, Chi, who, who gave a talk uh, this morning, uh, the, this linear MDP model. Um, block MDP is another model where uh, it's a different set of assumptions where you can do sample efficient RL. Uh, linear mixture models. Uh, th these these two models, uh, there's a sense in which they are pretty closely related. They, they both are kind of um, stronger linearity assumptions on the dynamics that let you do efficient RL. So they're much stronger than linear Q star, but on the other hand, we know we need to make stronger assumptions. Uh, 
uh, some conditions on POMDPs, which lets us do it efficiently in high dimensions. Uh, we can kind of kernelize this LQR. Uh, factored MDPs, uh, this pretty nice uh, setting where we can even think about a notion of future learning where we can uh, do efficient RL. Okay, and you know, the, the, the question after a while might be, what are the commonalities uh, that are, are somehow characterizing uh, the structure that is allowing us to do this? Like, is it just gonna look like a big laundry list of models where we can do RL efficiently? Okay, and there was this uh, really uh, a breakthrough paper, this Bellman rank paper, uh, and it was a breakthrough conceptually in that I think it really started understanding the underlying structural conditions, which allowed us to do sample efficient RL. I'm not gonna uh, go into too many of the details of this paper, but it really was uh, the first paper. It was a bit overlooked at the time, uh, but now people, yeah, like everyone knows that they, they really had some very deep insights here for uh, what's going on that actually allows us to solve some of these problems. Okay. And uh, there's another related concept, Bellman completeness. Um, there's a model-based version of this Bellman rank, which captured uh, some additional cases. Uh, more recently, there's a very nice paper by, uh, again, um, that is the wrong reference there. Um, that was an earlier version, but uh, she was one of the authors as well here. On this Bellman eluder dimension, it's kind of generalizing this eluder dimension concept. Uh, this is more about understanding a, termi a termination condition, uh, which, um, uh, which governs when you can do things. And uh, another um, kind of a slightly different way of viewing things from a structural perspective, which you could view as generalizing uh, this Bellman rank uh, condition where um, to, to, I'll kind of, you know, highlight what this condition is on the next slide without going into too many details, but somehow the idea is there's a particular low rank structure to these problems, uh, which uh, you can generalize it in this bilinear class. And in many cases, it's worthwhile just trying to use this condition to verify if your problem satisfies it. Okay, and if it does, you know there is an efficient algorithm for it. Again, what's nice about this, uh, these structure conditions is it becomes very easy to find new models under which you can do sample efficient RL. So like linear Q star V star you can do, uh, various other um, conditions you can think about and you can come up with models very easily by seeing if they satisfy the structural condition. Okay, uh, feel free to let, let me know if my slides aren't advancing. Sometimes I have um, a problem. We should be on bilinear regret classes now. Okay, so uh, given the, um, the time, so Dylan, I should stop around uh, 3.15? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, it's the lunch break after this, so it's probably okay if we go a little over, but yeah. yeah. No, but I'll, I'll try to stop then. So, uh, so maybe I won't spend too much time discussing the assumptions of the bilinear classes, but I'll, I'll give some of the intuition behind what's going on under the hood for this Bellman rank assumption and uh, the bilinear class assumption. And the basic idea is you're gonna look at your Bellman error. So the Bellman error is this one step look ahead error where you know, if you're optimal, so suppose this value function is greedy with respect to Q. Okay, and the, uh, so this is some kind of average Bellman error. So Q minus R minus V and expect, expectation should be zero if you've got an optimal value function. Okay, because this V is uh, the greedy value function induced by this Q. Okay, and the idea now for a lot of these is, approaches is the structural condition somehow posits that the average of this uh, Bellman error somehow uh, lives in a low dimensional space. Again, what's interesting about this assumption is you don't necessarily need to know the features of this, um, uh, of this uh, average Bellman error. But if you have this, uh, a type of property like this, uh, where this average Bellman error is small under uh, various other Roland policies, uh, then somehow the idea is this allows you to try to generalize and reutilize data because you can try to enforce this average Bellman error to be zero under other policies, right? Somehow the key for supervised learning is we have a way to reutilize data. And the idea for these approaches is the sum assumption which allows us to try to, you know, enforce this Bellman error is zero by reutilizing past data. 
Okay, so I'll let people look at the details uh, of these papers, but uh, it's a much stronger assumption that um, uh, that we need to impose to get things uh, uh, to work. Uh, and if you have it, you're good. Okay, but it's subtle. Okay, so let's uh, bump up a level now and uh, go back to uh, our picture here. Okay, and it'd be nice if somehow this was the full story, but uh, it kind of isn't because we do realize that uh, almost certainly the, the RL problems in practice we wanna solve once we start mixing in say deep learning approaches and so on, they're gonna have to go beyond, I think both these eluder and bilinear types of approaches. And on top of that, uh, we kind of believe, you know, we don't really know what the boundary is out here. And so in particular, uh, there may be natural things um, that, that actually do live out here. Uh, and particularly this is relevant when we start thinking about uh, even more nonlinear types of approaches. Uh, and uh, we'd also like to potentially get better insights for algorithms uh, that will work under various assumptions. Okay, and we know this is partly the case because uh, there's deterministic linear Q star assumption. So, you know, linear Q star doesn't work, but if the dynamics and rewards are deterministic, then you can in fact solve this problem. And that lives outside of, uh, uh, of, of what we know. So uh, now let's uh, think a little more broadly and ask, are there necessary and sufficient conditions? Like, can we really pin down uh, the, the line in the sand, which separates what's learnable in, in some polynomial sense and what isn't? Okay, and uh, you know, and this is a very general question. It's like, can we really pin down uh, what actually governs the learnability of uh, interactive learning problems under different modeling assumptions? Okay, this is part three, and this is gonna be some uh, pretty recent work. Okay, so, so let's bump up a level and consider an, a more abstract setting, uh, which is this decision-making uh, with structured observations. Yeah, there's a sense in which uh, this is basically just an RL setting, but I think phrasing it this way uh, lets us think a little more abstractly. Okay, so, uh, so th this uh, DMSO setting is a setting where uh, we have a, a decision set pi. So this is the set of feasible decisions. They could be in bandits, they could be arms. Uh, in uh, RL, it's gonna be policies. Uh, and in this abstract setting, uh, I'll ground it in a moment, uh, we have a distribution uh, over a reward, you know, it's gonna be an episodic setting. We have a distribution over reward R and observations O for every policy. So if we place some, some decision pi, then the world specifies a distribution of the reward we obtain and the observations we see. And the observations could be uh, just something in an abstract space. Okay, and the, the game is as follows. So for every time step, uh, the learner is gonna place some pi t. Uh, you know, that could be a policy, uh, it could be an arm. Well, nature is gonna re reveal some uh, reward rt. So this is capital R to distinguish it from little r and rl. And we're gonna observe some observation ot sampled from this underlying distribution. We, we just repeat this for a while. Okay, so uh, just to be concrete, uh, the way rl fits in this framework is uh, these pi's are policies, uh, what we're going to do is at every episode, we're going to uh, place some policy. The total reward in this episode, this big RT, is going to be the sum over the little rewards we see over the H steps. And the observation we obtain is just the trajectory of what we observed over the H steps. This is really a very abstract setting, this DMSO setting. These are just questions about the setting right now. And so don't, you know, so, so think of big R as just the, the reward in the episode. So it's really the sum of the little r's in RL, and O is any kind of abstract structured observation space. We good? Okay, so, so what's our um, uh, abstract goal here? Right, because, um, you know, obviously I could have like, uh, said DMSO is like a setting of RL too, vice versa, but it's nicer to kind of abstract it away, say we have the scalar reward, which is, you know, RL to some of the literal rewards, and some very structured observation space, which is how nature gives us information. And uh, what we're going to ask is really a decision theoretic analog of these classical optimal statistical estimation questions. Okay. And, uh, 
uh, that question is as follows. So let's just suppose we have a set of models. Okay, and think of a model as something for which, um, it, it's something for which for every uh, M in your model class, that's gonna specify a distribution over the reward and observations for any policy, right? So an MDP is a model because for every policy you have a distribution over trajectories and rewards. Okay, so for example, one, one example of a model class is the set of all tabular MDPs. Okay, and you can even do uh, model free approaches here because you know, just let this uh, model class script M just to be the, the set of all MDPs whose optimal value functions are consistent with being linear in this given feature mapping file. Okay, so this is very abstract. Uh, you know, the, the, we call it models, but it's very easy to make it uh, value-based or policy-based just through, uh, through uh, assumptions like this. Okay, now let's go, uh, go ahead and make this realizability assumption where we're gonna say uh, there is some uh, model where the truth is in this model class. It's in kind of hand-waving notation by dropping the subscript because for every model, it's associated with this family of distributions. But let's suppose there is a model such that the truth is in the model class, meaning that for every policy, pi and pi, that's gonna be specified by, uh, you know, the distribution R and O is gonna be specified by some uh, big M. Okay, and, and what's our, uh, 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 our, our regret question here, our optimal statistical estimation question here? Okay, so let's say the value function is just the expected reward uh, when we play decision pi. It is just like RL. So in model M, V pi of M is just the expected, uh, you know, the reward in that episode given that we play pi. And our abstract optimal estimation question here, this uh, min-max question, is what's the best we can do for an arbitrary model class script M uh, when we know the truth lies in this class. So this is a min over all learning algorithms. Uh, you know, the nature is gonna um, um, make things as uh, worst case as possible. And we're gonna uh, measure ourselves by our regret when we don't know the, the underlying model. So this is the best we could have done in the truth versus the performance of our, our, our uh, online decision-making algorithm, which, you know, observes the, uh, it, it uh, sees the observation and it, and it can update the decisions it takes at the next episode. Is there questions about the setting? So this is very general. It basically will capture all of the different settings we had before. And we'd like to understand, is there a way to start thinking about uh, the rate uh, we can obtain here based on properties of the underlying model class and various other regular conditions? Okay, so let's start getting some intuition uh, here and and uh, intuition for why this is a very subtle um, this is this is a very subtle uh, set of questions. So uh, let's try to understand when problems are easy or, or hard. And let's do this uh, with with uh, uh, with a zeroth order optimization problem. So there's some true model M, uh, and the setting is uh, our our decisions now are some real number, and what we're going to observe is. Uh, an underlying function corrupted with noise. So in pictures, suppose uh, we know the truth is one of these three functions. We are gonna play a decision, which is a real number. And what we observe is the function value corrupted by noise. And we'd like to do well over uh, playing this game many times. Okay, um, but suppose this is our game. Is, is this problem easy or hard? Uh, well, suppose I told you the true function lies in this class and you know we wanna maximize the reward. Uh, it turns out this is a very, uh, easy problem. Why? Uh, well, you know, just choose the decision here because this decision is simultaneously optimal for all the models uh, in this class. So, you know, even though uh, the optimal algorithm here, we're not going to discover the, the correct model. Uh, this is a very easy interactive decision making problem because uh, of this, um, you know, the, the, because of the particular properties of this model family. Because this one's easy. Okay, this one's a bit harder. Why? Because uh, we actually do need to do some type of exploration uh, to try to figure out where the optimal decision is, right? If we do something here, it's bad for this blue guy. If we do something here, it's bad for the, the red one. And we're going to have to bounce around uh, some amount of time before we can uh, narrow things down enough to start doing well. Okay, this is a bit harder. But let's tweak this to see why 
uh, this framework, uh, things can be very subtle here. Okay, so now let's change the functions. Uh, again, remember we're playing uh, decisions that are real numbers. We'd like to maximize our reward and we keep querying things and we get uh, corrupted feedback. We get the function plus a little noise. Okay, but now we've kind of bent this function down here and we've kind of created some nice big gaps here. So you know, think of this as a nice separation here. Okay, so now is this problem easier or hard? Um, it's basically easy, but what's interesting about this one, you know, you've got this kind of cheating action, which will reveal the model. Okay, so what you should do for this problem, if you're playing, again, if you're playing it for a very long time, you should really just uh, play this guy a few times to figure out which model it is, and then just jump to the right answer. Okay, and note that this framework um, is captured in this DMO type of setting because we, you know, our model class is this. Okay, so this is pretty subtle because if we're going to try to characterize this, uh, you know, this min-max rate, uh, there's all kinds of strange cases we could, um, uh, we, we'd have to deal with. For example, you know, maybe your, um, your model class is such that uh, you know, the low order bits in the Gaussian noise technically aren't noise, they might actually encode something about the right answer, right? Instead of adding epsilon noise in the bits like 10 to the minus 10 and lower, they, they, in some, you know, they have some bit encoding which reveals the right answer. That might be a corner case, uh, but what's subtle is that, um, and you know, you can maybe argue that this example I showed you now, like maybe this is just very unnatural, but once you start thinking about RL and what's going on, it's not obvious what separates these uh, weird corner cases because linear Q star isn't doable. And the cases that are doable are these, you know, um, eluder dimension uh, assumptions, bilinear class, Bellman rank assumptions. Uh, and, you know, we don't really have a good sense as to what's this, uh, uh, this separation. Uh, so, uh, so instead, you know, when, when we're working on this is the question is, can we really just try to generally get a, get a handle on what's going on for arbitrary classes M? But I think I've convinced you this is very subtle because uh, there are all kinds of weird things that you can exploit in an arbitrary model family to, to improve uh, the rate of regret. Okay, so going back to our picture here now, okay, and, and this is really going to be a punchline is... There's a, a real sense in which uh, this, uh, this new concept, the decision estimation coefficient, really does establish uh, this line in the sand between what is um, learnable and what isn't in this very general interactive learning setting. Okay, and, and in a precise sense, um, okay, so you should really view this, this red line uh, precisely as lower bounds, meaning that everything outside of this red line you cannot do and everything inside you can. And, and this accurately reflects this picture. So I'll, I'll be a little more precise in a moment, but um, you know, basically this DEC concept captures the learnability of all known models. Uh, and there are some subtleties, but there's reason to believe that um, with regards to sufficiency, anytime it's bounded, uh, we do believe that in fact, there is an algorithm, uh, you know, but we need some stronger assumptions to get sufficiency, but certainly, uh, from a lower bound perspective, it does look like this uh, DEC uh, is nailing the line in the sand between what is learnable and what isn't. Okay, so, so let's see what this complexity measure is. Uh, I'll just try to state uh, what it is and give a little uh, intuition about it in the remaining, uh, the remaining few minutes. Okay, so uh, it's gonna, you know, we'll start by defining, uh, defining with respect to some reference model in our model family. Okay, this gamma is going to be a scale. Think of this scale as uh, being like root t, which is the number of episodes you're going you're to play. But think of this as an arbitrary scale now, trading off regret and uh, information. Okay, so the idea of having this reference model is going to be that uh, we believe the, you know, so, so suppose we believe uh, the model is close to the reference model in some chaos sense. Okay, so that's what this uh, Lagrangian is doing. Okay, and what this, co uh, what this coefficient is, you can think about this as a game between uh, the, the learner and uh, nature. Okay, so the learner is gonna pick a distribution over a decision. So this is gonna be just a distribution of our policies. 
the nature is going to pick a model. Okay, and then we're going to look at uh, this expected quantity. The first term is just the regret. So this is just uh, how much, you know, this is our suboptimality uh, in expectation for the model that uh, nature has chosen. Okay, so that, that's just the usual regret. Okay, but the second term is uh, interesting because uh, we're getting um, a discount. We're, we're getting an improvement uh, if it turns out that for the decision we played, uh, what we're observing is far from the reference model. Uh, why is that helpful? Because that's giving us information that, in fact, uh, uh, the model isn't correct. Like it'd be very bad somehow if we, what we played was uh, uh, had regret and somehow wasn't giving us any information that distinguishes it from this reference model. Okay, and gamma kind of trades these two off. And this is sort of why this name is the, the decision uh, estimation coefficient. So technically the, the paper uses uh, the, the Hellinger distance, but Hellinger, like, this, is, this doesn't really matter. It's just for some technical, technical reasons. Okay, and then when we define the DEC, uh, we're just gonna take uh, a max over these reference models. Okay, uh, but uh, it's an interesting notion and certainly you know, it has some relations between prior quantities. Uh, if we think about reversing the order of this max and min, it also makes some interesting connections to, uh, to Bayesian approaches. Um, let's see. I would have a time for like one clarifying question if someone just isn't clear what the definition is. I mean, it takes a little while to think things through, but I, I think, you know, I, I tried to give you some of the intuition here uh, about the concept. Okay, so, so up to here, I've only defined a concept. I'll tell you what it's good for in the next slide. Um, I do want to mention what's interesting about this concept is uh, this concept really does seem to be the right generalization of um, a decision, you know, of, of a quantity that's characterized as the min-max complexity in uh, basically supervised learning problems. Uh, so this is really a, a line of work going back to Lacombe on optimal statistical estimation, and this seems to generalize like a, a certain modulus of continuity notion. Okay, so, um, so, now, so now what is this, uh, this notion good for? Okay, so, uh, so again, remember, this is a general setting where M could be essentially anything that you could you know, take M to be the set of uh, you know, linear MDPs uh, with some given feature mapping, or it could be model-free, uh, the set of MDPs whose, uh, um, linear, whose value functions are consistent with some Q star. So, so now let's look at the upper and lower bounds here. Okay, so uh, the lower bound is uh, really, uh, really nice here because it's very, very general. Uh, it, it's just some really minor regularity conditions. Uh, and what we have is that uh, the regret for any algorithm is lower bounded by, you know, we take a max over these scales uh, and we're really just trading off the, this coefficient at scale gamma times T versus gamma. So, you know, I think of gamma as like uh, one over root T, this often recovers uh, results in, in many settings. But, but this lower bound uh, basically is a very, very general lower bound. It turns out for upper bounds, we have to make further convexity assumptions, and then we can obtain upper bounds in terms of uh, some way to get at a supervised learning error. Okay, so I'm, I'll let people look at the, uh, the details, and that's why, in a sense, this doesn't entirely close uh, things, and you you know you you wouldn't expect to uh, to grab quite everything. But in terms of a lower bound sense, uh, there's not much reason. We don't have any reason to believe this doesn't this lower bound doesn't capture just about everything. I mean, certainly it's a valid lower bound, but uh, we do believe that uh, whenever you know that that it's achievable in in all reasonable cases. Okay, and in particular, you know for. Uh, for these sort of convex M, uh, that we get sublinear regret if and only if this um, this decision estimation coefficient decays uh, with respect to gamma at some uh, polynomial rate, and then we'll get sublinear regret. Okay, and, and to support this uh, this point, why this uh, this assumption really nails things down is, you know, just and okay. So before I get to that. Uh, I do think it's worth emphasizing that 
th this framework really is uh, generalizing this, um, you know, very important and elegant classical theory of optimal statistical estimation due to Lacan. And it's really bringing this to the interactive uh, learning setting in a very general sense. And this is a much more challenging setting because, you know, the game is, you're not just going to do MLEs for this setting. You actually have to interact with the world to, to, uh, to be optimal. Okay, so before ending, let me... Uh, not have the table. Okay, so um, just uh, okay, well, let me just end. So um, I had a table basically showing that uh, all of the, the known cases you could do with interactive learning. Let me uh, see if I can find it. So uh, before ending, I'll just point out that uh, essentially all uh, interactive learning frameworks, this DEC lower bound is basically tight in uh, up to poly factors. Uh, and sometimes, you know, in most of these cases, it actually nails the poly factors in the problem dependent quantities of interest. Now, you do have to do a fair bit of work to establish these rates, but it's a bit surprising that there is one quantity which characterizes the rate. Okay, so finally, let me just wrap things up. Uh, the main point here is that uh, we're getting a theory of how to handle RL in these high dimensional problems, which is clearly relevant if we start moving to more challenging multi-agent problems. Uh, we got some intuition that linear realizability we couldn't do things with. Uh, there's a framework uh, for uh, getting sufficiency. There's a couple of different frameworks that are natural. And more recently, there's this quantity that does seem to characterize uh, when learnability is possible. And finally, I should just highlight some of the uh, the terrific colleagues that were uh, involved in this line of work. And, you know, look, you know, more generally, this is really a line of work from the community, uh, but a couple of people I should highlight, like Rusang and Ian Hao on these lower bonds, Gaurav Mahagan and Simon Du for, uh, for some of this work on bilinear classes, and, uh, you know, Dylan and Gian. So Dylan's one of the organizers here, and he's really been just driving this work on the DEC and really trying to understand these fundamental limits of, um, uh, of interactive learning. And you know, he's around for the week, so definitely ping, ping his brain on the DEC, DEC stuff. So thank you very much and ha happy to take a few questions. Well, thanks a lot, Sham. Well, yeah, we can take some questions before we head off to lunch. Hi. Um, in your definition of DEC, um, you said that uh, essentially you build a Lagrangian. Have, does your definition also directly extend if you consider instead like um, a distance in terms of epsilon and you had like a coupled min-max problem there instead? When you say coupled, do you mean constrained or do you mean... Like a constrained coupled optimization problem where you're also looking for the optimal gamma there in some sense, like you, you pick an epsilon. So you pick the epsilon that defines the KL divergence between the two things. And instead you're looking for the optimal like Lagrange multiplier or the KKT multiplier associated with that epsilon. Uh, so in a sense, okay, so there's, a, there's definitely a couple, uh, a few subtleties going on here. So uh, in, in the way this proof works and in you know, the, the, the lower bound, okay, I, Maybe I'll comment on two things, and maybe Dylan can add a bit more. So with, with regards to the lower bound, uh, we're optimizing over uh, this gamma. So that is coupled. And it's actually important to trade it off with a gamma here. Because in a sense, like if you think about multi-arm bandits, there's this trade-off between, um, you know, if you do kind of don't discover the right thing, what do you get? OK, so, so from a lower bound perspective, um, it's explicitly in the statement because you are optimizing over the gamma. Uh, now, for the upper bound perspective, things are more interesting because uh, you would like to use this for deriving uh, the framework, but you know, this you know you could view this as just some some types of unknown. You you, you know you, one would have to I think have problem dependent information to understand how to set gamma with regards to uh, 
upper bound algorithms. And, you know, one can see that in multi unbanded frameworks. And I think one implicitly sees that in uh, like the square CB work that Dylan has done. Maybe Dylan can, you can add a couple of comments. Uh, uh, over oh, yeah. I, I mean, I can just briefly say like, yeah, so the conditions you would like to use to relate this to kind of a constrained version, they don't exactly go through due to various like properties of the setting. You can kind of do lower bounds in terms of like a constrained version of this quantity, but yeah, the upper bounds, not obvious. Right, yeah, but I think part of, but the other half of the question was about uh, um, if you could actually set the value of gamma like in the program somehow. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. There, there's a sense in which you really shouldn't be able to do that in like a yeah. data dependent fashion. Yeah, that's the that's the point, yeah. right? Like uh, you kind of need some problem dependent quantities to get. I mean, for the lower bound, there is a sense in which it is set because we just have a max over all the scales. Um, for sure. Well, let's see. Are there any other questions? Oh, hi, Pong. Yep. Uh, so I have a quick question about the model. So there are problems where uh, within each episode, the learner can update the policy based on the feedback on the fry. So can your model capture this kind of problems? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, be because, um, uh, so I mean, the DM, the, okay, so abstractly the answer is yes, the DMSO does, but in terms of the way the lower bounds work, they aren't really getting at, um, uh, you know, like think of it this way. If I told you H was like super, super long and you only had one episode uh, and if you mixed, then you could solve, uh, you know, you could do RL, like the lifelong learning kind of setting. And the lifelong learning setting T is one. Okay, so it can't, it sort of can't capture that. So there is a sense in which the, the DMSO framework allows you to do that. But the lower bounds do not really say anything uh, meaningful uh, when H starts becoming, you know, if you think about the RL setting where H starts becoming very, very large, uh, it, it's, um, yeah, it, it doesn't really capture uh, it, that regime. Um, but, uh, you know, conceptually, all of the cases we know how to handle these things, we often mix or reset or, um, uh, that there's some implicit way of restarting the system uh, through mixing or resetting uh, to address this. And it's plausible some of the techniques can uh, be extended to this, but it's much easier to do the analysis with the separation of making things episodic and try to pin that one down first. Is that... Is that uh... Cool. I mean, Dylan, uh, can... Are there uh, any other questions for now? All right. Uh, oh, I'll just check the chat. No, no, no questions in chat. Um, yeah. So I guess if that's it, I guess we can stop there and, uh, you know, go for lunch. Uh, but yeah, let's thank Sham again. It was a great talk.